happening and I'll just Welcome, this is Tyler Crone, Chair of the 36th District Democrats. We are so excited to interview Christiana Obey Sumner this evening for District 5 City Council. Over to you, Christiana. Well, thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about who I am. Uh, my life's passion and work has been socially equitable policy solutions. And because of my reputation for helping diverse and intersectional organizations and communities, and having multiple pathways towards shared goals to work together. Many people have encouraged me to take the next step, run for public office and bring my skills to city council. I am prepared to hit the ground running by collaborating with our neighbors across District 5 and the city to establish multiple pathways toward our shared goals for deep rooted solutions to longstanding issues. Like focusing on social and sustainable housing for everyone and investing in health and human service workers and all the other workers and labor that we have in this city. It is scaffolding infrastructure gaps to address persistent disparities in our community and working on how we can have a city and a, a district that can be safe for everyone to, to bike, to walk, to ride and to roll wherever they need to and to get to where they need to have to be. So in order to find sustainable solutions to these persistent problems, we must start with the policies and the systems as the root causes of inequity. I founded a social equity consulting firm specializing in social and organizational change, anti-racism, disability justice, and intersectionality. And in this role, I engaged with stakeholders, analyzed policies, and helped bring equitable change to over 200 nonprofits, small businesses, corporations, and government entities. But that's not all. In addition to my large portfolio of social policy consulting and research, I formerly worked as a direct social and housing service worker. I've also served on several boards, including the King County Transit Mobility Council, the Washington Low Income Housing Renters Alliance, and Building Arts Space Equitably or BASE. Finally, I served as former co-chair of the Seattle Renters Commission and the Seattle Disabilities Commission co-chair with my former co-chair, I helped to pass one of the nation's first minimum wage bans. So together we can bring parity to all areas of disparity as MLK once said, all life is interrelated, whatever affects one density affects all indirectly. And knowing the intersectional ways that this has happened through my vast experience, I hope Hi. to be able to bring those, those skills to D5. Thank you so much. We, we, we're getting a handle on our timer. We will get it set up for the first question. We'll be asked by Jasmine. Jasmine, over to you. Yeah. Uh, what steps will you take to ensure the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, LGBTQ people, uh, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? The most difficult thing about this question is that it, it, it compounds onto all of the additional questions that you have, because you can't address one issue without addressing all of the issues around transportation, housing, climate change, all of those things. But specific to this question, what I will say, and what I always advocate for, is the importance to amplify the voice and leadership of the communities that are most impacted by disparity and to bring parity to all areas of disparity. There's a lot of people who talk about that and amplifying those voices and leadership. When we say that we're going to do it, we need to do it in an actual transformative and holistic way. That means seeding power and having a power with dynamic with communities. Not just the individuals, but the organizations, nonprofits, and groups that are already doing amazing work and have data that is around what the community actually needs at its core. Since I've already done this throughout my entire career, I would continue that practice as the council member for District 5. I would have, I would work to fund participatory action research programs as well as their investment directly into communities and, and nonprofits and organizations doing this work and as representative of those communities. In particular, we know that racial disparity and intersectional disparity is a significant issue in this city and across our society and it has only deepened and gotten worse. 
In order for us to truly ensure that our intersectional communities, especially leading with Black and Indigenous communities and people of the global majority, we have to ensure that all of our policies are looking at upstream issues and origins and addressing what is happening presently for downstream issues. Since that is my skill set and what I have done throughout my career, I would continue that practice as city council. Thank you so much. The next question will be asked by Toby. How would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meet the Seattle's Green New Deal goals? One of the frustrating, but also uh, curious elements around our green, you know, our climate is issues is that I think that people are not understanding the extent to which it is a mortal threat to everything and to how entrenched it is. It goes beyond, you know, whether or not, you know, that we have to, we have to have a holistic approach. So we have to reduce the number of cars on the road, full stop. I understand that freight is an important part of the city as well as tourism, but we can work towards having all of the mechanisms of transportation be sustainable. We also need to ensure that we are using infrastructure techniques and mechanisms that are going to increase the ecology and the interdependence of our system, such as using rain gardens or making sure that we're using trees if we're having, if we're having areas where there's increased flooding. We also have to acknowledge that there are elements of climate change that are already happening. We live in a city where we continue to have uh, heat waves, we continue to have uh, you know, wildfire smoke, but we don't have anything in place for elders and people with disabilities that can't make it to the lobby of their apartment building or can't make it to a community center. And so we need to make sure that we also have sustainable solutions in place for those folks. Finally, we live in a city that obviously is you know, way past due for a earthquake or some sort of natural disaster. Fun fact about me, I've, I have survived nearly every type of natural disaster except for a tsunami and a sinkhole. One of the things that's really important about that is disaster planning that is inclusive and it embeds principles of disability justice. Not an equitable uh, climate uh, preparedness plan if it does not include all members intersectional in our community. And that's what I would fight for as a city council. Thank you so much. The next question will be asked by Ginny. Ginny? I, I didn't unmute. I'm sorry, my bad. That's okay. I'll get it. ready. The Move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine-year transportation levy will go before the voters in November 2024 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? I think the first thing to think about is having complete streets. One of the most frustrating things about District 5, and I fought for this as co-chair of the Disabilities Commission, is that we don't have sidewalks. And not just we don't have sidewalks, we don't have pedestrian and bicycle safety. And the sidewalks we do have are not well-maintained. They can have ingresses for people with wheelchairs or with strollers. They can not have curb cuts, but they also don't, we're not thinking about the new uh, community that we have that we have that we didn't have when the past levy um, happened, such as what are the rights of way for things like lift? What are going to be first and last mile transportation methods um, from our public transit and how can we increase use of public transit? What does it look like to ensure that our pedestrians and our bikers are able to move about their community without fear of being harmed or hurt or becoming, um, coming into contact with potential issues of safety? All of these things are extremely important to ensure that we're able to have communities where all of our neighbors are safe and able to survive and thrive. Finally, I think it's really important to consider um, to the previous question, the impact that our transportation is having on our climate. And the increasing density also means increasing the infrastructure for folks to be able to have a community that they can get all of their basic needs met. 
we don't have, a, in, especially in District 5, we don't have a lot of uh, access, especially walkable or, or transit-based access to not only our natural resources like our parks and our lakes, but to things like grocery stores or the hospital. East-West transportation is deplorable and it's really difficult to walk along Aurora Avenue when there isn't a place to walk um, except for the street. So as the uh, Canada for uh, District 5, what I would advocate for is bringing those skills and knowledge to the council so that we can put that into the levy, um, especially with the complete streets being a core central focus. Thank you so much. The last prepared question this evening will be asked by Sherry. Over to you, Sherry. Hi, um, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address the crisis? Well, as I said, I used to work in direct social service and particularly in housing and permanent supportive housing. The job I had before I started my business was in Harborview as a housing coordinator in the social work department. So let me tell you a little bit about what we might be doing wrong. The biggest thing I saw in doing that job is that we are trying to uh, move folks from being unhoused to housed without considering what is ca the cause of housing. Meaning we're not really addressing root cause issues that might be preventing, uh, creating barriers to even accessing the housing at all. I had clients who I would try to call around to organizations and shelters before and after the coordinated entry had taken place to see if they had accessible housing and they did not. I had clients who was in permanent supportive housing, which is single resident occupancy, who became pregnant and it was told that they would have to either leave their housing if they wanted to keep their baby or give their baby up for adoption. I had clients who were using external outlets for CPAPs and electric wheelchairs that uh, they needed to be able to survive and spend my entire day as a social service worker calling shelters to see if they could guarantee a bed next to an outlet and they could not. The waiting list takes six, to, to six months to do five years. And I think that we have a great opportunity with I-135 and the social housing levy. I personally grew up in social housing. Uh, I was born in Anchorage, Alaska and lived there until I was 10. And social housing was a way for my single mom uh, to be able to have a safe place for us to live. The unfortunate thing is that we live in a city with a high amount of vacancy and we need to ensure that we are either um, bringing that vacant, those vacant uh, rental uh, residential units back into the fold or that we have a vacancy tax. Finally, we need to ensure that we're having effective and sustainable solutions as getting to the taproot of the issues. And so we have to make sure that folks have a home to grow into that is accessible and that is actually going to meet the needs and be um, affordable for folks of all uh, social economic classes and backgrounds. Thank you so much, Christiana. We will now go to questions from the e-board as follow-up. Toby, your hand is up first. Over to you, Toby. I'm asking this question of all city council candidates. Inclusionary housing is explicitly allowed by recently passed state level missing middle zoning bill to help ensure production of more low income housing in every community. How would you support using it in Seattle? The first thing I think is really important that I, is, a, is, is a concern of mine that I would love to do a study on is the extent to which the development of new housing by demolishing existing or what they call naturally affordable housing um, is actually raising the price floor of the lowest um, re rental unit. And so I think that's really important. Uh, we need to retrofit most of the buildings in the city anyway. Um, so I think that being able to use existing housing or to convert single family housing into duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes for family housing would be a first start. Second of all, I think it really comes down to community education. Um, as a social equity consultant, working with folks to address and surface elements of bias or stereotypes is within my wheelhouse to ensure that we have collective and community buy-in so that we can embrace all of our neighbors as we start to in increase the density and Thank you. The, is there another follow-up question from our e-board? 
Sherry, over to you, Sherry. Hi, um, I'm interested in like one specific action you can take to, um, uh, I'm gonna just address the issue of the no sidewalks and the no safe way to get to places. Both my kids went to Ingram High School and it's a high school and there is not, a, we live, there, we have an inner urban great bike path. There's bus service in Lake City, but to get east west, it's not only is it hard to get there, but there, it's very, very dangerous. So um, I'm just wondering like, this has been an issue for years, um, but is there some specific tactic you have to like get it done? You know, I do think that, uh, like I said, I think that when we go through this new transportation levy um, and we start to put into place what is needed, um, during the Mike McGinn era, there was some really great policies that were coming through that was really talking about what it looks like to increase the corridor, especially of Aurora Avenue, Lake City, Greenwood, Fifth Avenue, Northwest, and Northgate, so that it has complete streets. It has sidewalks that are accessible to all folks. It has uh, spaces for folks to wait for buses that are safe. It has uh, 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 sidewalks and it has um, lights that are based on pedestrian modality as opposed to cars patients. And all of those things, as you said, has been uh, blocked or had barriers um, that are really wonky and political. What's really fun about wonks and politics this is the time when we're starting to create things like a levy to really advocate and have innovative um, ideas and interventions and solutions that are amplified by our community who are already doing this work. Thank you. I see Jeremy, your hand up. You just continue on that answer, like describe some of the solutions you're thinking of, some of the wonky solutions. Yes. So I think in particular, one of the things that I came into, um, into when I was doing this work in, as a dis, as co, um, co-chair of the Disabilities Commission is that D5 is this interesting area where like everyone passes the buck around who is supposed to increase the infrastructure and the sidewalks, right? Um, and so it's one of those situations where every time I would advocate, they're like, we have to go to this person or that's really a county issue or that's really a state issue. And one of the things that's really important about a city council member is to find what the solution is and to continue to move upstream until you can figure out what the impetus of the issue is and then you try to find solutions to address it. So whoever it is and whatever it has it takes, whoever I have to advocate to, whoever I have to amplify my community's voice and leadership to, what I'm going to do because at the end of the day, D5 needs to increase its pedestrian and bicycle safety for the children, as we said, and for elders, for disabled folks, but for everyone. Thank you so much. Is there another question? We're coming up on time. I think, given that I don't see a hand raised, maybe if you, if there's something else that you would like us to know, or else anything else you'd like us to share as we close out the last minute of our interview with you. One of the things I, I would want to say, I guess, in closing is that, as you can tell, this is something I'm very passionate about. I am a very excited and honored to be able to run as a candidate for Seattle District 5, but to be completely honest, I'm a wonk. A wonk. I'm doing this so that I can hopefully be able to be on the dais and be a representative so I can really get to the meat and the heart of the issue. Because I have worked with so many different city departments, uh, agencies, and nonprofits, organizations in the city, community movements. I've been in, on the commission. The people at city council know me. My first job here for work study was working in the city clerk's office. This is something I've known, I've done, I've been in those halls. I know those people, I know the dynamics. If I was elected to be in city council district five, it would just be a continuation of the advocacy work that I've been doing. So they moved to Seattle 13 years ago. So this is something that what I'm trying to do is to have a lot of wonky things slapped into a minute or two minutes, but I assure you, there is a lot of thought and uh, strategy and stories that I am synthesizing that I would bring to this role. Thank you so much, Christiana. This concludes the formal part of our discussion tonight. And now I'll hand over to Jeremy to share 